All right, we'll get started. Um, so thanks again to Anwar for that, that great talk. Um, interestingly, our headquarters is also in Amsterdam. We, that's where we started as a company. Um, and we started in Australia around 14 months ago. Now that was just me. Uh, and now there's about 14 of us. There's a few of them down the back there. Um, so now we're going to talk about various tubey things. So this is, is everyone familiar or is anyone familiar with our Beats products, specifically Packet Beat? One person, wow, we're doing a really bad job with that. Anyway, so Packet Beats is like um, application level uh, packet analysis. And um, so when Greg, this gentleman here from Optiva, was describing this to me, I said, oh, this is Packet Beats. And he said, yeah, but it was before Packet Beat uh, existed. So I will hand it over to him and we can hear about how he out packeted our Packet Beat. Hello. Um, I'm Greg, I'm a structure engineer here at Optiva. Um, I'm going to preface this by pointing out that I don't know anything about Elastic, um, but that's okay because we can talk about other things. Um, this is actually going to be more about uh, a particular use case that we have, um, which encompasses you know, boring stuff like monitoring uh, networks, which is a, very much a solved problem, um, but from a HFT perspective. So although we have the same monitoring requirements, requirements as a lot of other people, um, we get thrown in some weird curveballs um, that other people might not expect. Um, please, next slide. There we go. All right, so here's a, here's a summary of, um, I guess, some of the, the problems that we're trying to solve. Uh, these are legitimate questions that our team will often get. Um, and some of these seem really bizarre. And I should clarify that the, the timestamps up the top are in milliseconds. And we would go lower than that if we actually had the capability to. Um, Anwar touched on the fact that um, nanoseconds aren't supported. The granularity of Elasticsearch is only milliseconds at the moment. And there's a colossal and ridiculous discussion about um, changing that. But it's actually really hard to solve. Um, one of the more recent uh, posts in that thread on GitHub pointed out that the quite limiting fact that most people don't have an accurate enough clock to be able to timestamp at the nanosecond level. Um, and even if you do have an accurate enough clock, I mean, you still have a, a drift between different machines. So if you have three elastic search boxes and they're timestamping at a nanosecond, it's really, really hard to ensure that they're actually timestamping correctly. Um, so, I mean, even recently, we had a, had a, a query about was there a network issue at this time, between this time? It's like, well, maybe. <laughs> Don't know. Um, wish I could tell you. Um, do you know why this type of message has been delayed? No idea. Sorry. Um, can you confirm no traffic from the development network reaches production? Actually, we did solve that problem. Um, but Elasticsearch would have made it easier, etc. Um, so the, the team I'm part of, we're actually, so Anwar mentioned that um, we have 40 ish WAN links. Um, it's something like 50 plus if we include China, but China special. Um, these circuits are all massively geographically distributed. Um, and so as I again touched on, uh, having issues with these transient or even for extended periods of time is extremely common. Um, when we get questions like, for example, the top one, um, it's really important that we're able to understand the underlying cause of faults and be able to confirm that a fault existed in the first place um, in order to actually action it. If we can't confirm something's happened or you know we have no idea what our network is doing then we can't actually do anything about it when someone comes to us with a question like that. Um, and when you're working in HFT for a 400 millisecond period um, you're potentially exposing yourself to unacceptable amounts of risk. Um, and at the end of the day, it's, it's a business cost for us. Um, so for most people, you'd use NetFlow for this type of stuff. It's like, how much bandwidth am I using? Who's talking to who? What protocol? Um, blah, blah, blah. All that kind of stuff. QoS, boring, boring. Um, generally, that's, that's pretty good. Like, that'll, that'll give you most of the information you need. Uh, but our requirements are significantly more granular. 
Um, there are a whole bunch of proprietary tools that can do this kind of stuff. Um, we generally find that proprietary tools don't necessarily offer the value. Um, and problems like this are, are very much solved, especially, I mean, even in the open source world, these are, these are solved problems. We shouldn't have to pay someone like $100,000 a year just to understand what our network is doing at a, a granular level. And quite often, the proprietary tools do many, many, many things, but they don't do one thing well, um, which is obviously the Unix philosophy, do one thing well. Um, what we really needed was the ability to look at the network metadata and what our networks were doing, um, be able to mutate that data in some way and you know, easily serialize and deserialize that data. Um, we needed visibility. We needed to understand what's going on. We actually genuinely don't have very good visibility, which is weird. And we really wanted to increase our visibility down to this millisecond level. So when someone came to us and said, what happened at this you know, 400 millisecond range, we can actually say, oh yeah, well, blah, 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 blah. Super cool. Um, ha ha, internet pictures. Um, so we, this is something that's been going on for a long time, um, but only recently we've really gained some traction with it. Um, and so we sort of got thinking about what we actually need to do cool stuff. Um, so we wanted at least millisecond resolution. I mean, that's, that's pretty rubbish compared to some of our other applications, entirely proprietary applications. But it's good enough for us to be able to tell someone, yes, there was a problem. We can confirm this. We can actually see that there was a problem at this time and here's what we can do about it. Um, as Anwar mentioned, we've got a lot of remote sites all over Asia. Um, and in Asia, all sorts of weird things happen to your networks, which makes the second point actually harder than it really should be. Um, getting the data back here in 60 seconds, eh, it's not that big a deal. Getting it indexed for every single packet going across a WAN link gets a bit harder. Um, and we also have other teams within the organization, for example, the application engineering team, which Anwar is a member of, um, that potentially want to consume this data for other reasons, or our data services team. Um, for understanding the latency uh, across our paths or between our applications, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, packet beat before packet beat was cool. Um, uh, promiscuous mode accounting daemon is a little piece of software that's been around for a really long time now, actually. Um, it's open source, it's pretty cool, it's written in C, um, maintained by like one guy. Um, and it's actually really good. So we started using PM account. Um, actually, prior to PM account, we just did PCAPs. We did PCAPs to file. And if we needed to extract data from those, we would do it manually, which is a faff. Um, PM account can take or can promiscuously listen to a network interface, like a WAN tap or something like that. Um, and it can output the network metadata to various formats. This is an actual example of a packet, or sorry, a message output from PM account. It's in JSON. Uh, this is what our documents look like. They're just JSON documents. Awesome. We can do whatever we want with them. Um, I've obviously obfuscated some bits and pieces, but you know, there is data under there, believe me. Um, and so for every packet that traverses our network that's picked up by these sniff interfaces, we're getting one of these messages and we're sending it to Elastic. Um, so when we started doing this, uh, when we moved to PM account, which again, I should point out, is, is very much like packet beat. Um, packet beat is really go, so it was pretty easier to extend. Um, and, and packet beat didn't, didn't exist when we started doing this. Um, it was only fairly recently in comparison to that came about. Just need some zesty beverage. Um, so this kind of reiterates a bit on what Amar talked about. Um, I was one of the people that was relentlessly harassed by him. Um, Part of our, our initial stack, uh, we'd have physical hosts down the site, network tap, so basically they're getting a copy of all the data that's coming in and out um, of a link. And then PM account would promiscuously listen and it would um, send JSON data out to MQP, which it natively supported, uh, which in this case was MQP. Uh, sorry, RabbitMQ. Um, this would lived in Amazon, 
It was really just a proof of concept thing. Um, I wrote a rubbish little consumer to munge the data a bit and do some cool stuff and encapsulate it for the Elasticsearch bulk API. Um, and then it went off to an Elasticsearch locally hosted. Um, it was really good for like a, a first pass. Um, we did have a lot of problems, which like when you're, when you're talking about monitoring a you know, 500 meg link or a one gig link and trying to capture every single packet from that, um, you can imagine that we ran out of space pretty quickly on one box. Um, and the performance wasn't great. Uh, we also found that if we deployed this into the field, so like out to a remote site, quite often because of the nature of the traffic with, you know, with very small packets, um, the metadata that PM account was trying to send back for processing was actually larger than the original packet itself. Um, and that was actually a really big problem because one day we broke the network. Um, and actually, so again, Anwar, I'm just going to keep referring back to Anwar, uh, mentioned that we wanted to uh, uh, come up with our own solution. Because we do now currently, and we'll talk about more after a bit, we do currently use the Amazon managed Elasticsearch. There's also, uh, I think recently, Elastic um, offered their managed service as well. Due to reasons, we can't use that. Sorry. Um, the uh, Amazon one's good enough. Um, but it's a bit weird. They actually announced it the day after we all sat around working out what we were going to do, so that was good. Um, so that's kind of where Kafka came in, and Kafka's super cool. Um, RabbitMQ is lovely, but Kafka is, is awesome. Um, so the Kafka protocol actually allows for compression as part of the actual transport protocol. Um, and this was, this was brought in essentially just to fix the ridiculous problem we had where we were essentially getting amplification of, of um, the data, where more data was being sent, um, more metadata was being sent than actual data was being generated. So you pretty much have the exact same thing. I chucked me will be in there just because it's fun. Um, some Kafkas, awesome. Um, and some zookeepers, which exist just for Kafka reasons. Um, and we already had most of the code we needed to make this work, so it was fairly much you know, just a drop-in replacement for RabbitMQ. Um, we still use RabbitMQ, it's running fine, but the Kafka's running better, way better. Um, a downside to this, though, was that PIM account, although it could talk natively, as of fairly recently, it can talk natively to Kafka, uh, the downside to this was it didn't natively support compression to Kafka, which is what we needed. Um, we were, gonna, we were considering um, putting up a bounty on Freelancer and getting someone to add that in. Um, but then I came across a cool little tool called Golem by Trivago, which is my new favorite thing. Um, and Golem um, is not mentioned on the slide here, but, uh, oh, sorry, it is. Golem, Golem exists between PM account and essentially Kafka. Um, and it's just a, a message multiplexer and router that takes arbitrary inputs, does some magic filtering, JSON, um, forwarding and then sends it to an arbitrary output. In this case, the arbitrary output is compressed Kafka. Um, and so we found that by doing this, um, we could get about a 60% reduction in message size using Snappy, which is a um, compression algorithm um, written by Google originally. Um, and we hit about 75% with the uh, deflate or zip. It's pretty good, but it needs a lot more CPU power. So now we're able to get our messages back to Elasticsearch in Sydney, you know, manage Elasticsearch um, hosted by Amazon. Super cool. Um, so this is actually a number I picked yesterday. It was actually, it was greater than 300, 300 million. Um, and out of 50 links, like we had 5% tapped. Um, we obviously have to tap the RX and the TX. So that's fun. Um, this is actually lower than it was previously. It was just because I couldn't be bothered going back and finding out more. Sorry. Um, now, this is actually my only slide that shows some Kibana things, so enjoy. <laughs> um, so I can't really show you all the information, obviously, due to reasons, but um, I point out the timestamps per down the bottom. So this is actually a 100 millisecond window. Um, and we have all this different data, this 100 millisecond window looking at a couple of hosts on a single link. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, 
here's another cool graph. This is actually um, solving a fairly commonly solved problem already, which is uh, basically just a top talkers list. And it's been obfuscated, so it looks ridiculous. But it looks boring, but it actually provides really valuable information to the infrastructure team. They can get a list of hosts and their conversations and understand who's talking to who and how much data. Um, and I don't remember which, how long this time period was, but it certainly wasn't a lot. And then we just have some other stuff. So like this is this is essentially bandwidth used by um, TOS class. So like various cross classes, who's using how much bandwidth? You know, trading might be green, bugger all. Um, ops might be purple, a lot. Um, actually, and with, because of the the nature of the underlying, like the, the rawness of the data, um, there's actually a lot more correlations. Um, that we're hoping to find and to utilize uh, in the future as we start to expand this out. Uh, that's all for me. These are where you can find more information on these things. Um, I did actually want to do a live demo, but I failed, so I'm not doing that. Um, if you've got any questions, I'll be around. Thanks, Greg.